weekday mornings at 9. It cannot measure the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. Senator Joseph Biden faces charges of plagiarism and dishonesty, and his presidential candidacy is suddenly in jeopardy. Good evening, I'm Ted Koppel, and this is Nightline. To join me this time... His lofty oratory is often borrowed from others, and there are documented charges of plagiarism in law school. I was wrong, but I was not malevolent in any way. The question now so is whether the Biden candidacy can be rescued from these and other mistakes. This is ABC News Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. You may recall the saying, be nice to people on your way up because you'll meet them on your way down. You may even recall that Jimmy Durante said it. Actually, Durante borrowed it from a fellow by the name of Wilson Meisner, who died in 1933. Mr. Meisner is relevant to tonight's broadcast because he is the man who also said, when you steal from one author, it's plagiarism. If you steal from many, it's research. Senator Joseph Biden, Jr., Democrat from Delaware, chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee and announced candidate for president, stands accused of what might be described then as political research. That may prove to be the most short-lived scandal of this political year, or it may be the death knell of a campaign that was just about to get underway. Is a politician borrowing rhetorical flourishes from another politician really an issue? Well, as Nightline correspondent Jeff Greenfield reports, it all depends on how it's done. And then he said, I propose to you, my friends, and through you, that government of all kinds, big and little, be made solvent and that the example be set by the President of the United States and his cabinet. End of quote. That was Franklin Delano Roosevelt's words. It is the most venerable of rhetorical techniques. If you want to sound majestic, cite the most majestic of political scripture. Now that well-worn device has created a major political flap. You all will make the judgment about that. It'll all depend on how you write it. I don't mean that. I'm not being smart. It'll all depend on the American people looking at me. They're going to look at me and say, is Joe Biden being honest with me? Or is Joe Biden not being honest with me? I'm being honest. Today, Delaware Senator Joe Biden had to turn away from presiding over the Robert Bork confirmation hearings to answer charges that he has been appropriating the thoughts and words of others without credit. Why am I the first Kinnick in a thousand generations to be able to get the university? It was this campaign commercial for British labor leader Neil Kinnock, frequently cited with credit by Biden, that began the dust-up. Last August, at an Iowa Democratic debate, Biden seemed to be claiming Kinnock's vision and life as his own. Why is it that my wife, who's sitting out there in the audience, is the first in her family to ever go to college? Why is Gladys the first woman in her family in a thousand generations? To be able to get the university, was it because all our predecessors were thick? Is it because they didn't work hard? My ancestors who worked in the coal mines in northeast Pennsylvania don't come up after 12 hours and play football for four hours? No, it's not because they weren't as smart. Why it's didn't not. they get it? Was it because they were weak? A story splashed across the front page of the New York Times, whose source was almost certainly a political foe of Biden's, triggered the media flood. It showed up in Iowa, site of the first 1988 caucuses, then reappeared in the New York Times with a new charge, that Biden had appropriated a famous litany from the late Robert Kennedy about what the gross national product cannot measure. It cannot measure the health of our children, the quality of our education, the joy of their play. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. I don't know anybody who has run for public office, who has tried to communicate a great idea, who hasn't gone back and used other great ideas to make those motions. That's certainly true. Any former speechwriter, present company included, will tell you that this is one of his most trusty companions. In fact, many of the best known lines ever uttered actually came from somewhere else. Let me assert my firm belief the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Or, as Henry David Thoreau said, 
nothing is so much to be feared as fear. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. Or, as Warren Harding said, we must have a citizenry less concerned about what government can do for it and more anxious about what it can do for the nation. I am paying for this microphone, Mr. Harding. Or, as Spencer Tracy said in State of the Union... Don't you shut me off. I'm paying for this broadcast. Don't cut him off. Moreover, most of the words of most presidents are not crafted by them, but by the anonymous speechwriter. That we shall pay any price, bear any burden. Behind John Kennedy's inaugural was Theodore Sorensen. We will never forget them, nor the last time we saw them this morning as they prepared for their journey and waved goodbye and slipped the surly bonds of earth to touch the face of God. And speechwriter Peggy Noonan was behind Ronald Reagan's eloquence after the Challenger disaster. But, like but says former Reagan writer Ben Elliott, the sentiments flow from the man himself. But it is the person himself or herself who's giving it, who uses compelling language, who knows his case and, uh, and very much feels what he wants to get across. Who, who succeeds in the end by taking the people with him. Adam Walensky was Robert Kennedy's chief speechwriter. One of the ways we measure a president is the quality of the people that he's able to attract to his service and therefore to the service of the country. So, if a man is good enough that he can attract somebody who can help him write words that 20 years later somebody's going to want to steal, that tells us he might be a hell of a president. Moreover, even in this age of the mass media, the 30-second soundbite, the speech remains a principal link between candidate and citizenry, as it has throughout our history. You shall not crucify mankind upon a cross of doom. That speech won William Jennings Bryan a presidential nomination 91 years ago. You and I have a rendezvous with destiny. That 1964 speech, Reagan quoting Roosevelt, started the former actor toward the presidency. Thus, say the wordsmiths, charges of misappropriation carry heavy political weight. To take somebody else's words as a substitute there, then, makes it a counterfeit politics. He's telling you that he's not showing you his real character, because his real character can only come from his own words and from what he, whether with or without the aid of his staff, what he has created, what he's had a part of, and what comes out of his own uh, uh, mind and stomach. The problem here for Mr. Biden is he has built his reputation as being a great orator. So when one finds out that a lot of the words that he's using were in effect already said by someone else, then that makes it particularly troublesome for him. The Biden campaign argued today that their man was the victim of a bum rap, that a few inadvertent omissions of credit were being made into a political issue by his enemies. But we live in a time when George Romney's run for the White House was destroyed by a comment about brainwashing, when Ed Muskie may have been fatally undone by some melting snow on his cheeks that some thought were tears. The question now is how badly Biden has been damaged by these charges of textual misconduct. Jeff Greenfield for Nightline in New York. For any candidate, there clearly is peril in taking a speechwriter's text and delivering it without first checking it out and perhaps even greater peril in departing from the text the speechwriter provides. When we return, we'll be joined by two men who've written speeches from both ends of the political spectrum, Pat Buchanan and Mark Shields. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by CERTA. Joining us now in our Washington Bureau are columnists and political commentators who have first-hand experience with the art and trial of speechwriting. Pat Buchanan used to write speeches for President Nixon and resigned earlier this year as communications director in the Reagan White House. Mark Shields has crafted the public words for Democratic presidential candidates, including Robert Kennedy, Edmund Muskie, and Morris Udall. And let's begin with the, uh, a couple of the tough political assessments then. How much trouble do you think that Joe Biden is really in, Pat? Um, Ted, I think, um I think he's finished. I don't think it'll be apparent right now, but I think uh, over a matter of a couple of weeks it will, because Joe Biden has alienated the men and women of words in this country. 
that act of plagiarism or the acts he admitted to would have cost um, Robert Bork his nomination and any young journalist in our profession at the Washington Post or elsewhere caught in that many acts of plagiarism uh, would lose his job and it would be the end of his career and I don't think Joe Biden in the takeoff stage can survive this. Mark Shields, do you, do you take quite as, as, as grim and glum a view of, of the Biden future? No, not at all. Uh, I think he's been hurt. No two ways about it. This was the biggest week of his life uh, politically in the sense that he was chairing the uh, hearings on the confirmation of Robert Bork to the Supreme Court. He's being introduced to a nation, tw only 20 percent of whom had an impression of him. But I think in the final analysis, the voters of uh, specifically Iowa and New Hampshire will decide Joe Biden's fate along with anybody else in this race. Uh, and I think he's probably cured one problem. No one will call him Senator Bidden after uh, this week. No, everybody knows who he is. But as we were all remarking, uh, as we sat in the green room just before the program and looked at tomorrow morning's Washington Post, the Bork story is below the fold. The Biden story is up top. It's the off lead. That's not the kind of publicity he wanted to get. No, it, it certainly isn't, uh, and I, it, it is not at all helpful, but I, I am not quite ready, uh, Pat, uh, in, in unseemly haste, uncharacteristic of him, is ready for the post-mortem. I'm, uh, I'm not. I, I think he's been hurt, but this is a test of uh, his character and how he handles the adversity. Let me, let me tell you why I think it's a problem, Ted. In middle America, it's unlike the Donna Rice thing, you know, which is very boom and everybody understands it immediately. This problem is with people who deal with words and ideas, scholars, journalists, intellectuals, and others. It's a mortal sin with those people, and that's the people who are going to have to portray Joe Biden to the American people if he's going to rise at all. He's about at four or five percent. At this point in his career, I think it's fatal. If he were Ronald Reagan and had been caught at this, okay, he's way up here. But that's why I think it's going to prove uh, fatal eventually. Who had the, uh, let's, let's look at the old uh, prosecutor's uh, question, who had the most to gain from, from Joe Biden's demise? Now, clearly, uh, his Democratic rivals have something to gain. Uh, certainly those who uh, were afraid that Biden might do damage to Judge Bork's nomination in his role as chairman of the Judiciary Committee have something to gain. Well, there's no doubt about it. I think Biden has been, I mean, in terms of ethics and intellectual capacity, he's been severely damaged as any kind of authentic critic of Judge Bork. There's no doubt about that. Well, it's very tough, is it not, Mark, for, for him to sit now in judgment, in effect, or even as an effective prosecutor of Judge Bork in these hearings. I think he, uh, his position there has been undermined severely. Uh, and uh, I, I think, again, his presidential candidacy has been hurt. Uh, but I don't think, it, I don't think it's done. Uh, the Bork uh, nomination was helped uh, considerably by this week's events in Joe Biden's life. Let Ted, me, yeah, go ahead, Pat. Ted, uh, you know, the Democrats aren't going to take advice from Pat Buchanan. I don't think they ever have. But really, the no if they went ahead and nominated Joe Biden with all this stuff having hit on them, another, quote, flawed candidate, liberal from the Northeast, uh, they really would be asking, they really would be asking for it again. All right. I, I would just add one thing to that. Pat's good friend, John Sears, uh, who is, his, I think, a respected so Republican working for Biden now? Is there is, <laughs> said that he thought Joe Biden would be the strongest uh, general election candidate uh -huh. uh, for the, the when Democrats. When did he say could, that, Mark? Nominate. How long ago was that? He said that on Monday of this week to me. <laughs> okay. All right. My, my point is, my point is that I, I Pat, uh, is uh, counsel is gratuitous and, and, and <laughs> worth what we pay for it. Uh, I, would, I would simply say that uh, uh, whether, in, whether in fact he is the nominee will not be determined by the events of the past 24 hours. The one thing that is really devastating, I, I think, in the whole charge beyond the, the law school business, which was when he was 23 years old or whatever, is the, the, the Kinnick. I mean, he takes uh, from the Kinnick statement, uh, the labor leader of uh, Great Britain, well, uh, what sounds like a very personal testimonial a very almost a, a, an apology a pro sua vita by now uh, by now Kinnick and and Neil Kinnick and makes it his own and that's the one in other words he, he, he fabricated his family history what you got here is what T.S. Eliot called a hollow man an empty man who's filling up this empty vessel with someone else's background history and ancestry and that suggests a real flaw in character not seen now by the country but it will be. All right, gentlemen, let's take a break. When we return, we'll be joined by the man who provided American political prose with the Neil Kinnock commercial, which got the Biden campaign in such hot water.
Joining us now in our Washington bureau is William Schneider, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a contributing editor of the Atlantic magazine, and a political columnist for the Los Angeles Times Syndicate. Mr. Schneider was in London covering the British elections in June when he became so impressed by Neil Kinnock's Labor Party campaign that he brought copies of the TV commercial back to the United States and passed it around. What, what were you so impressed with? I thought it was the most effective political ad I've ever seen. The use of music and the portrayal of character I thought were brilliant. And I, wa I was impressed and I wanted to share it with my fellow political professionals. Uh, the point being what? That, uh, that here was something they might want to copy or, or uh, in, in technique or here was something that they might want to copy in technique and substance? Uh, the point was that this was a skillful and professional piece of political advertising that impressed me and I thought would impress them. I thought Americans could learn something for once from the British. We still haven't seen the, the commercial in its entirety. How long did it run and, and what, what is it that we haven't seen? It ran about 10 minutes, which is uh, the time allocated by the broadcasting services in Britain. Uh, and I think what you haven't seen besides the speech, which was very impressive, is the terrific use of music. It was made not by a political consultant, interestingly, but by a professional movie director, by Hugh Hudson, who won the Academy Award for having made Chariots of Fire. I thought there was a lesson in that, too. And, and what was the thrust of the political message? I mean, beyond this kind of roots of the common man, which Neil Kinnock was was clearly conveying, and which in, in his case I, I gather is also true, what else was being conveyed? I thought two things. One was uh, it was the most effective portrayal of character that I've ever seen in a political ad. And secondly, it, it communicated a sense of commitment and compassion, which in Britain worked to bring the traditional Labour Party back together again. Neil Kinnock did very badly in the election, but it brought his competitors on the left, the Social Democrats, back to the Labour Party, and they were destroyed as a competitor. Now, what lessons uh, should we derive then from what from what has happened to Joe Biden? I mean, clearly, you don't you don't steal verbatim, uh, or when you do, as he did, 99% of the time, you give credit. Is it a wise idea, though, to take something that personal anyway? from another politician and try and appropriate it to your own campaign. Well, Senator Biden today said that he had been intellectually careless and sloppy and that he had done stupid things. I agree with that assessment. I think it was a stupid thing to uh, appropriate uh, material that was really very personal that was someone else's. He acknowledged that, and I think that was uh, a correct acknowledgement. All right, let me bring Pat and, and Mark Shields back uh, into this discussion. When does it make sense, then, to borrow from some of the greats from the past, be they of your own party or someone else's? I mean, Ronald Reagan, for example, has, has frequently quoted from FDR and has quoted from Jack Kennedy. Uh, so, I mean, there doesn't seem to be any, any political problem there in only quoting from your own. Pat? No, there isn't. As a matter of fact, uh, Ronald Reagan, of course, came out of the FDR tradition. He admires JFK. And this is, this is common usage, uh, especially among Republicans, uh, incidentally, picking up uh, attractive, prominent Democrats and, and using those quotes. But uh, uh, that's utterly different than what we saw. What, what Biden should have done, Ted, is this. Take a look at that film and show how Kinnick expressed himself and then talked about his own background, his father, what he came from, his grandparents and things, in his own words about that background. He just took the whole thing and made himself Neil Kinnick was the problem. And if... He had, for example, Mark, done that, and and someone had had merely noticed the the similarity in style. Would there have been any problem? I don't think so. Uh, I, I really don't. The the grave robbing, which is what it's called politically, of reaching into the other party's great uh, store of. Uh, uh, treasury of, of great quotes. Which, uh, incidentally, Democrats rarely do with Republicans. Well, Abraham that. Lincoln and Teddy Roosevelt, there aren't a lot of Warren Harding lifts, uh, quite <laughs> frankly. Uh, and now, you know, Richard Nixon is, is another man uh, <laughs> who had a last press conference in 1962, we all recall very mm -hmm. dearly. So that's a premature post mortem. I, I think that uh, it would not have been a serious problem for, for Joe Biden in, in that case, as Pat described it. All right, so let's, let's uh, summarize, if we can. Uh, what, what will other candidates derive from this experience? What, what should they? Well, I think what you're going to get is, I, I guess I, I want to quote it, I read it in the paper. <laughs> what you're going to get is a, a lot of uh, so-and-so said and a lot of real care taken to put quotation marks around things that normally wouldn't even have them around them. Uh, for Biden, he's going to have a very rough time of it, Ted. He's going to be on Johnny Carson. He's going to be ridiculed. The cartoonists are going to be after him, not only her block. He's going to have a very rough 
10 days, which is going to test the character of the man. All right, some closing okay. thoughts uh, Some closing thoughts from, from Mark Shields and William Schneider, but that when we come back. We'll continue our discussion in just a moment. Continuing our discussion now, uh, uh, Mark, it may have been you or Pat were, were mentioning a moment ago uh, uh, what uh, Herblock would undoubtedly do with this. Here's what he does with it uh, tomorrow morning. There's Joe Biden saying, we all make mistakes, but we must press on. I was just thinking on the way over here, four score and seven years ago. And there's the cartoon. Now, that's what they're going to have to live with. What does that mean to, uh, what does that mean to, uh, no, you've got to move it over here, guys. There it is. What does that mean to uh, speechwriters from here on in, uh, Mark? How much responsibility does the speechwriter bear? How much responsibility is solely with the candidate? Well, I think that the ultimate responsibility is with the candidate. Uh, and at just one point of personal privilege, I did work for Robert Kennedy. I did not write speeches for him in the spirit of candor. I want that uh, point established. <laughs> but you have, you have written speeches for candidates, right? I, have, I sure have. And uh, unfortunately, most of them are in private life today. But uh, what, he, what he, I was Deservedly trying to... so. <laughs> Pat, is, Pat is absolutely right that uh, there's going to be a lot of opposites and ibids and, and documentation like uh, term papers. Uh, but it is, the, in the final analysis, the candidate's responsibility. And uh, I don't know if Joe Biden could kid about it, go to Indiana and say, uh, they told me to use my best stuff today. So I said, ish bein ein Hoosier, uh, you know, or, or try to do it that way. I don't think you can. I think this is uh, too serious a problem for it. it he just has to go on from here, try and do the best job he can chair in the hearings and, and then get back on the campaign. All right, Mr. Schneider, you had some observations about the nature of this campaign that makes this a bigger issue than it might otherwise be. Yeah, I think that the fluidity of the campaign is important. Where there aren't enormous issue differences or ideological differences among the various candidates, then personal characteristics loom very large, as they do in this election. Mm -hmm. Romney and Muskie, we talk, you talked about before, didn't really have an issue base, a constituency of people who deeply believed in them. Jesse Jackson and Ted Kennedy did, so they, it was easier for them to withstand this kind of criticism. It's one of the problems for Joe Biden and most of the candidates, like Gary Hart, is they don't have strong issue constituencies. None of the Democrats do except for Jackson, and so it's that, very hard. And on that note, I've got to stop you and thank you, uh, Mr. Schneider, Pat Buchanan, Mark Shields. Appreciate you coming in very much. That's our report for tonight. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night.